Yeah, Global Connection is here on Think Tech, the nine o'clock block on a given Thursday. We are joined by uh, Sylvia Ottonetti. Uh, she is with Project Expedite Justice, and right now she's in Madrid. Um, good morning, Sylvia. Good morning, uh, Jay. Thank you for having me here. It's actually afternoon, isn't it? Yes, it's, <laughs> it's evening, <laughs> 8 p.m. here for me, yes. So Sylvia, you spent uh, a fair amount of time in Ukraine, um, and um, you have friends in Ukraine, and you're in touch with them, or at least you have been up to this point. So can you describe, at least from your observation and their comments to you, what it's like? Yeah, um, the, indeed, I've lived in Ukraine, in Odessa, for uh, six months uh, in 2020. I was an intern there and I had the opportunity to meet a lot of uh, students uh, uh, from the area and uh, made a lot of great friendships. Uh, at the moment, the situation is uh, very critical. Um, it's uh, um, near to a human catastrophe. Uh, and uh, my friends, uh, some of them uh, have taken up arms and others are in bomb shelters. I have uh, two friends uh, from uh, my hometown in Italy because uh, in Italy we have a big Ukrainian community uh, who uh, left uh, Italy um, soon before the beginning of the recent escalation, so uh, a week ago, um, to, um, uh, to get their, their, their documents from uh, Ukraine. And unfortunately, they got stuck there. They are students in Italy and uh, their mother is in Italy. I talked to them yesterday. Luckily, they're in the western part of Ukraine that right now is still relatively safe, uh, but uh, they are scared, obviously, like everyone else, uh, they have to go to shelter, uh, bomb shelters uh, when the siren uh, goes off uh, and the situation is, uh, is very critical. Yesterday, they actually, um, we actually got to talk and uh, they uh, tried to explain me the situation and what they're going through. Uh, so if I may, I would like to report uh, some of their thoughts uh, uh, of what's happening. Please. Um, so I'll be translating from uh, Italian because they sent me the message in Italian. Uh, but they said, in Kiev, uh, from the 24th of February, uh, millions of Ukrainians are hiding in bunkers uh, or uh, in underground metropolitan stations. Putin had said that he wouldn't have bombarded the uh, civilians uh, and uh, residential uh, buildings only infrastructure, uh, military infrastructure. But in reality, already uh, during the second day, we've seen that he's been bombarding everything he sees. Regarding Kharkiv, uh, the last two days, uh, small towns have been bombarded around the city as well as the entire um, city infrastructure. For now, Kiev and Kharkiv uh, are the main fighting spots, but they've been bombarding other cities like Mariupol, uh, Chernihiv, uh, Kherson, um, and uh, Zaporizhia. Um, but a lot of people are not uh, escaping, they're not leaving. They said they don't want to leave uh, because this is their home. A lot of people are trying to stop uh, Russian tanks, uh, even without weapons, uh, and simply uh, yelling uh, Slava Ukraini, glory, glory to Ukraine. And sometimes they manage to stop them. In the West, where I live for now, it's uh, quiet, uh, but people are preparing for the worst. Uh, and uh, others, uh, the way they can, uh, they've been volunteering, uh, they've been hosting, uh, hosting refugees, uh, been preparing food um, for those who need it in the East. But Ukrainian, uh, a lot of Ukrainians have been donating uh, money to uh, the uh, army. Um, for instance, a man over eight years old, uh, he donated all of his savings, uh, a hun uh, around 100,000 grivne. Um, that are like all the money that he has saved in his uh, entire life. But Ukrainians uh, are not giving up uh, and they are not afraid. Uh, the first days of chaos are gone and now Ukraine is more united than ever against the enemy. So these words uh, really touched me uh, when I read their message because uh, um, they're clearly living it in uh, um, uh, first person. They're like suffering uh, these, uh, uh, these atrocities. Um, and uh, other friends uh, are in uh, even worse situations. A friend of mine just told me yesterday that um, Russian forces entered uh, his uh, city and they've been uh, bombarding with everything they can uh, all day long. Uh, and uh, they have been just sheltering. He, the same friend that previously told me, uh, informed me that he was going to join the territorial defense uh, to fight uh, for his country and uh, for his family. 
And right now, the situation is that they're trying to gain control of uh, the uh, nuclear plant that is 30 kilometers north of the city, which is uh, Vos uh, Vosnesensk uh, in the Mikolai uh, um, Mikolai Oblast, which is northeast of uh, Odessa, a bit above of uh, like the north of the of uh, Kherson. Um, and we spoke uh, while he was in bomb shelter and uh, he was uh, just about like, as we spoke, they were like managing to exit, but he said, he doesn't know uh, what is happening. He doesn't know how to react to, uh, to it. And, uh, and he said, uh, I guess the ki uh, killing civilians, it's just uh, Putin's style. So clearly my friends are, are suffering very, are suffering very much and I'm, I'm very worried uh, for, for them and, and for what's to come. Well, that's awful. You know, on, on some of the points uh, you made, uh, I, I, I tell you that uh, this morning, uh, Zelensky announced that 16,000 people from outside Ukraine had volunteered to come and fight with the, uh, the Ukrainian army. And uh, he welcomed them. And there, yes. will be, there will be more, you know. Sylvia. Yes, absolutely. Uh, everyone is united uh, against uh, Russia right now, uh, trying to help Ukraine and Ukrainians that live abroad uh, have been returning to their countries to fight. Even uh, the son of a friend of my mother that managed to leave uh, right before they closed the borders uh, to um, uh, to uh, adult uh, men, he was thinking himself of going back and taking up arms. Uh, and defending his uh, his country from the invader from the invader. At the same time, uh, yesterday um, Macron uh, had a had a telephone call with Putin, where Putin indicated that he intended to occupy all of Ukraine. And uh, you know the implication is that if he had to blow it all up into a parking lot, he would. Um, so that's consistent with what's happening, and so tragic and irresponsible, incredibly irresponsible. Um, it is a war crime, in my opinion. Is it a war crime in yours? Yes, it absolutely is a war crime. Uh, he's been attacking civilians. He's uh, showed uh, no respect for human life. Uh, um, he's, uh, he's been targeting uh, um, like hospitals uh, as well as uh, um, administrative buildings uh, and uh, uh, residential buildings. Uh, um, it is certainly war crimes are being committed, uh, uh, which is also why we've seen uh, the ICC getting involved uh, in the matter and opening uh, the prosecutor uh, decided, requested the opening of an investigation, uh, several, um, uh, several referrals by um, I, countries that are party to the ICC have uh, been submitted. Uh, so now the ICC is ready to start an investigation in uh, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity and uh, genocide possibly. These are like the crimes that they're exploring. Um, and uh, unfortunately the crime of aggression falls uh, outside uh, of, uh, of the jurisdiction of the ICC uh, because Ukraine is not a party, neither is uh, Russia. But uh, Ukraine had signed an ad hoc agreement uh, in 2014 uh, following uh, uh, the um, first round uh, of uh, this war, right? Because this war did not start uh, eight uh, days ago. This war has been ongoing since uh, since 2014, since uh, Putin annexed Crimea. And uh, the investigation was started in the context of the protests, uh, uh, the Euromaidan protests in Kiev. Um, but then was uh, the its scope was expanded so as to cover any crime that's been committed since the 2014 including the crimes that are being committed nowadays well you know one thing about war crimes is you have to have evidence and until yesterday um evidence was streaming in from all parts of ukraine by telephone calls such as the calls that you had um by by photographs over cell phones and social media um and by video over uh, cell phones and social media to say nothing of television but it, it seems like mr putin has woken up to that problem and uh, he wants to stop the flow of evidence uh you know proving war crimes um, and other communications so he has started knocking down the cell phone towers he has tried to turn off the internet, both in Ukraine and, and in Russia, by the way. 
to, to silence the voices of those who would protest his invasion. Um, and of course, he has knocked over the television towers. Uh, so it seems like um, the evidence that was coming in until yesterday uh, will be constrained going forward. Um, I recall also that at some point, uh, Zelensky asked for uh, satellite uh, phones, which would continue to operate even if the cell phone towers were down. I don't know if um, Ukraine actually got those, but it would seem to me that uh, um, that the Western Europeans and the U.S. ought to be supplying a lot of um, satellite phones and supporting the satellite costs on them. Um, yeah. Do you know anything about this? Can you talk about this? Can you talk about how you get evidence out of Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. Um, indeed, that's a, um, a potentially be a problem. Uh, luckily, the technology that we have these days, as you mentioned, allows us uh, to gather evidence uh, um, like directly on the spot uh, um, and be shared all over the world. Uh, Putin's efforts uh, to undermine the sharing of these evidence uh, have been uh, um, have shown the, their uh, results on his side, but at the same time, evidence will keep flowing. There are a lot of organizations uh, involved, uh, from individuals to investigative journalists to collectives like uh, Bellingcat, uh, which is also uh, known for its previous investigation in uh, 2014 uh, about the MH17 uh, downing. Uh, they're now tracking the use of cluster uh, munitions in civilian areas, and they're also like built a map uh, tracking all the attacks in the various cities, uh, including video and photo evidence that can later be used uh, be used uh, in um, uh, prosecutions, whether at the national or inter um, international level. A lot of other efforts have been made by other organizations uh, uh, in creating uh, guides uh, to increase uh, the capacity building of civil society organizations and individuals that are seeking to document these atrocities. Uh, so they'll be guided in how to collect this evidence uh, to the standards that are required to uh, possibly uh, convict uh, the perpetrators. So this is a certainly uh, a big development. This is also what we need people to keep doing, keep documenting and keep sharing, um, like sharing everywhere on any social media, uh, wherever they can just spread uh, the, the truth uh, and uh, unmask also misinformation that is being uh, spread by, by Russian media. You know, you mentioned cluster bombs and I'd like to dwell on that for a moment because I don't think people really understand what it is and what it is intended to do and what kind of injury damage and death it can do. What is a cluster bomb, Sylvia? Um, and why are the Russians using it? Right, I'm uh, by no means uh, an expert uh, on uh, um, like military warfare, uh, but the use of cluster bombs uh, is uh, particularly uh, damaging to civilians uh, because uh, um, it, um, is just a very um, uh, intense attack uh, that um, is not per se um, um, a breach of uh, international law, uh, though there are some, uh, um, some treaties that prohibit the use of such bombs, uh, indeed because of the damaging potential that they have uh, on civilians. Uh, um, and uh, but uh, neither Russia nor Ukraine are part uh, to our party to uh, this treaty. Nonetheless, uh, an indiscriminate use uh, of uh, uh, warfare uh, against the civilian population qualifies uh, as a war crime, whether the use of uh, such weapons uh, is per se legal or not. We have a question uh, from one of our viewers, Sylvia. Yeah. Mind you, you know, we were not aware of these most uh, horrendous things uh, when this first started. Uh, we, it was, the jury was out as to whether this was a war against um, you know, the Ukrainian government, uh, military, or the people on every block. Now that has, that has been shown that it is a, a war against everyone on every block. And the question here is, um, so we've had an escalation, okay, of the level of violence, the level of uh, attack, um, the irresponsibility of the, of the instructions to the army, the Russian army. And the question is, Will there be an escalation of sanctions uh, applied to Russia for attacking civilians? Because now we know that Russia is directed at attacking civilians. So do you think there should be, there, or is there 
an escalation of the sanctions based on that revelation. Yeah, we have certainly seen an escalation in the sanctions by several countries, uh, um, especially the EU, but including many other uh, assets uh, have been frozen uh, from the Russian Central Bank, uh, the Ministry of Finance, uh, uh, Putin and other high profile figure of the Russian government. Um, and while initially we saw perhaps a, a slow response, uh, even by Euro um, European countries, everyone was asking for more more sanctions more effective uh, um, uh, responses. So we also saw then on the second or, or third day that um, Tata and Russian banks have been taken out of the SWIFT system, which is certainly damaging uh, their economy. Um, and we've seen an increasing uh, movement and development by these countries, by governments, by foreign governments uh, in trying to uh, undermine uh, Russian efforts by hitting them uh, economically. And it's also quite interesting that um, uh, perhaps this was uh, is not the reaction that Putin expected, right? We've all been trying to understand his strategy and uh, uh, trying to make a sense out of it, but it seems just very difficult. Uh, um, perhaps uh, he did not expect uh, such a strong reaction by European uh, governments, because uh, he saw in previous instances that the reaction, uh, for instance, in case of poisoning, also annexation of Crimea and the fighting that has been uh, going on in Donbas since uh, 2014. Um, Euro Europe or like the West or the foreign governments have intervened, but with uh, mild sanctions, whereas this time the sanctions uh, are uh, directed like specifically at undermining uh, Putin and his government. Um, so the hope is that um, um, the hope is uh, indeed to undermine the economy, uh, so not to allow Putin to like keep uh, going on with this war. He's also losing the uh, support of many oligarchs. Um, as we've seen, uh, because they've been uh, obviously particularly strongly hit uh, by the sanctions uh, um, and they, they're losing a lot of money. So if they withdraw their support, uh, perhaps we'll see also a change. But it's it just cannot be like I, it's too early to say what could happen. Also, given uh, Putin some predictability and uh, uh, the way like looking at the way he's been conducting this war so far, it's uh, hard to make predictions. Well, we talked to somebody in, in Belgium a couple of days ago, actually yesterday, and he said that people around, including young people, uh, were concerned that this was the harbinger of World War III. Um, how do you feel about that? Is, it, is that threat um, present? Is that threat implied in what Putin does and Putin's uh, unpredictability? Is, is, that, is that fear? Um, you know, uh, uh, through your community, your community in Project Expedite Justice, your community um, in Italy, uh, your community such as you are in touch with it in Ukraine? I think uh, everyone I've spoken to and um, myself believe that the threat uh, is real uh, of, uh, third, uh, of World War Three. Um, particularly the, the nuclear threat is extremely high and was seen like putting uh, threatening to use such uh, warfare if uh, um, if someone intervened. Um, but um, yes, in terms uh, like we've also seen the West uh, proceeding quite cautiously, um, NATO too um, has been quite wary of imposing a, a no-fly zone above Ukraine which is uh, um, they, they've already like made clear that they do not want to intervene uh, with uh, troops uh, on the, the territory of Ukraine, but uh, perhaps uh, many, have, uh, many have called for a no-fly zone to be imposed. But that would require the military involvement uh, of NATO and uh, that has the potential of being very destructive. We've seen in the past uh, what can happen, what is the risk uh, when uh, two countries uh, like the US uh, and uh, Russia that have such a huge uh, nuclear arsenal, um, like the way that this can threaten uh, uh, the entire world. Uh, um, so surely NATO and Europe in general, I've seen like everyone's been in the US too, have been proceeding cautiously and uh, in doing so they've also received a lot of uh, uh, criticism by the people that are demanding more, but clearly it's a very delicate situation and the risk of escalating a World War III is high. 
and uh, decisions should be taken weighing all the um, all the aspects of uh, of this uh, and not forgetting indeed about the the potential of uh, uh, the destructive potential of uh, of a nuclear war you know sylvia i suggest to you the human tragedy is only starting to unfold um and i'm reminded of uh, stalin's uh, effort successful effort uh, to starve ukrainians back in the 30s and indeed he starved many many millions of ukrainians to death by cutting off their food supply. Um, and that has the possibility now, it, it's haunting to think that Putin who fashions himself another Stalin uh, would cut off food, make it unavailable to Ukrainians, which are hunkered down um, and starve them now, today. Um, and so you have further possibility of human rights violations and atrocities. Furthermore, you know they will be separated from healthcare um, and clean water. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a big problem because over time, it's a waiting game. It's essentially a siege and people will die. Um, do the people you talk with in Ukraine express concern about that since starvation is no way to go? But now people I talked to did not express concerns uh, about starvation. Um, but clearly um the tactic uh, as you said of like medieval this medieval tactic of siege that uh russia is uh, uh employing uh, it's a uh, potentially very destructive for the civilians uh, that will not have uh, access to food as you said uh, which is already like uh, um being a scarcity in uh, some uh, in some cities like kharkiv the mayor of kharkiv uh, uh, was uh, particularly concerned about this uh, as well as uh, uh, the access to water um, and heat uh, that was lacking because uh, Russia had uh, cut it off. So clearly, um, this uh, yeah, this is not a war against uh, the Ukrainian government, as Putin initially said. This is a war against the Ukrainian people. He's uh, making, uh, he's attacking civilians. So he's starving them. He's uh, um, trying to like uh, these not even uh, they're not even letting civilians uh, leave from many cities uh, like including Kharkiv which is uh, like particularly having been bombarded between yesterday and today and civilians are trying to flee but are had they're struggling so clearly the, the attack is not like the the aim is not just uh, to undermine the government uh, um the people though are responding the Ukrainian people are demonstrating incredible resilience uh, in the way they've uh, they've been uh, uh, resisting to this invasion, this act of aggression, because uh, that is what what it is. So that is what we're talking about here. And um, uh, people have taken uh, like have uh, taken up arms, uh, joined uh, like street fighting. Uh, they've tried to block roads uh, so the, like to to, uh, to stop uh, uh, tanks, uh, as well as the convoy that we saw was approaching Kiev. Uh, that is also um, uh, was being like uh, was like uh, on pause at the moment because uh, of the intervention of Ukrainians, as well as uh, logistical issues so that like Russian uh, um, troops um, like maybe have had. But it's certainly a very uh, a very worrying situation in terms uh, of the human tragedy, in terms of the impact uh, it will have on the people. We've seen that a million people have left the country already in eight days. A million people. That's an incredible number. These people are like uh, just fleeing for uh, their safety. They're going to uh, Poland. A lot of them, half nearly half of them, to Poland, um, but also Ukraine, also Hungary, uh, Moldova, Romania all the bordering countries and they're being um, also um, uh, transported to other or like they are finding means of transport to other destinations in Europe to join their families. So it is- so Will uh, Europe is, accept them? Will Europe accept them? Will Italy accept them? Will Germany accept them? Will France accept them? Yes, for sure. Everyone will accept uh, uh, the refugees, not just uh, within Europe, but also other countries outside of Europe have shown willingness to accept uh, Ukrainians fleeing the conflict. You have friends there. You spent time there. You know, you you applied for your internship there. Um, and um, you so you have a sense of what it's like um, to be, you know, Ukrainian. And, 
And of course, uh, you're Italian. The Italians have a special, um, a, a special good nature, may I say. That's an understatement. I, I love Italian people. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in any event, <laughs> what did you think of the Ukrainians? What did you think of their good nature? Um, you know, how close were you in terms of having friends there? How close are you? Uh, what are they like? I have to say my experience in Ukraine has been uh, one of the best I've had so far. Um, I've lived in uh, a few countries, uh, but Ukraine has been, or Odessa in particular, uh, has been like one of the places I've had the easiest time to adapt to. Um, everyone has been extremely welcoming since the beginning. Uh, it was uh, it was almost unbelievable how like welcoming they would just be to like a foreigner, right? Um, from the university staff uh, to um, university students, a lot of people contacting me, uh, wanting to meet me, wanting to exchange ideas. Uh, um, it's been uh, it's been really a wonderful experience there in Odessa, and uh, I've uh, long wanted to, to return. Uh, and I hope that I'll also be able to to do so. Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's very heartbreaking now. I've I've been lived there. I've been like witnessed, uh, like uh, I mean, yeah, walked in those streets. Uh, now, like seeing those same streets uh, being uh, bombed, uh, and my friends uh, like taking up arms to fight there for the families. Uh, it's it's just incredibly heartbreaking, but shows a lot of bravery from their side. Uh, and uh, I just really hope that every, this will end soon, and uh, and we'll be able to to see each other again very soon uh, and walk on the beaches of Odessa. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could find uh, an indication that it will end soon, but it doesn't actually from all indications right now, it's not going to end soon. Sorry to say. So I know you you made notes for our discussion, Sylvia, you thought about it a couple of days anyway, you had a lot of things that you wanted to express. I don't know whether you've expressed all the things you wanted to express. Uh, we have a few minutes left and I would like to offer you the opportunity to make any other statements, express any other thoughts and reactions that you had planned to, to, to mention. Yeah, I would like them to uh, make a final statement uh, and also an appeal to everyone that is uh, witnessing these atrocities. Uh, uh, we've seen the government, uh, they are proceeding cautiously to indeed avoid the nuclear threat, uh, as you said, and also safeguard their economic interests. But, it is clear, it is also clear that um, Putin had uh, underestimated the European response, as I said, uh, uh, there has been a gradual increase in response uh, uh, at the sanctions level, as we said, but also at the accountability level with the ICC, the ICJ getting involved. Uh, um, we've seen a lot of the response uh, uh, across the globe. And I guess what Putin had not realized is that these are our friends, uh, our brothers uh, that he attacked. Uh, um, and as the EU, they are our neighbors. Uh, they want to join our union and we want them in. And this is a process that's been ongoing already for some time. And in many aspects, uh, the Ukrainians are already uh, part uh, of uh, the EU. So many Ukrainians uh, live in European countries, as I was mentioning, there's a huge community in Italy. And uh, I have uh, lived in Ukraine, and I'm sure that um, I'm not the only one, like me, many others, uh, friends uh, in uh, Ukraine, or classmates, or family. And this is also true for the Russian people, because like we let's not forget that some of the Russian people are also like, if not all, are a victim of uh, this tragedy too. Uh, they've been strongly protesting in squares, uh, risking their lives. Uh, more than 6,000 people uh, have been arrested since then. And uh, a lot of Ukrainians have uh, families in, Russian, uh, in Russia. They are... Um, they've uh, like they have like a good relationship like the ukrainian people tend to have good relationship with the russian people um in terms of obviously the situation is very delicate but like they have family there some of them and also the russian people are um it's their children that are dying too in this war and i'm happy that the ukrainian people who are demonstrating incredible resilience and it's really admirable but let's not leave them alone against uh, this uh, insane uh, uh, megalomaniac uh, who after invading a country has been committing such uh, um, grave atrocities against uh, civilians so, so let's not leave them alone we have options so let's use them 
Um, we need to fight back uh, as the international community with everything we have. Uh, so let's bridge the debates on accountability and sanctions. Uh, let's fight with uh, every uh, on every possible front uh, on every possible front to really undermine uh, uh, Russian power. And also. Um, Let's not forget that we have also the possibility of doing something about it, right? All of us can contribute to this, whether it's through pro protesting. A lot of people uh, find it perhaps uh, um, not very effective at times, but protesting can help. Uh, in, and it also helps uh, um, uh, the Ukrainian people, right, to show that we're with them. But it's also about creating spaces uh, where uh, we can share ideas, connect to people, and raise awareness of uh, what is happening. Well, what else can we do? We can donate. Uh, we can donate uh, directly to the Ukrainian army if we want, uh, or we can also donate to NGOs that are getting involved uh, on the border. They are trying to uh, help the refugees uh, or uh, getting food into Ukraine. And uh, uh, we can also offer our skills. Uh, so us uh, at PJ, uh, Project Expedite Justice, uh, are uh, volunteering, some of us are volunteering our time now to work uh, on some projects on sanctions uh, to help uh, um, and contribute in the way we can with our legal skills uh, to the situation, right? Um, and also in, I heard that in Romania, there are dentists, for instance, offering free service to Ukrainian refugees. Uh, so a lot of people are getting involved in the way they can, and that's what we need to continue uh, doing. So we don't have to be the decision maker to be able to do something about the situation. Uh, we have the tools, we can fight uh, misinformation, we can increase awareness. Uh, and in our like um, individual capacity, we can still contribute, uh, um, hopefully to bring an end to this, uh, to this war. Silvia Ottonetti, I am profoundly touched by your comments. I'm sure many people. Thank you so much for joining us today and helping us understand what it looks like from Europe. Aloha.